Hey guys, welcome back. We got a quick lesson today. It's the some of the technical details of actually analyzing how a calcium ion uh, computer might work. A calcium ion quantum computer. And the first thing we need to look at is the energy levels available, the relevant, I guess, energy levels available in the calcium ion. And uh, the main levels that we're going to be using to actually do calculations are the S1 half ground state and the D5 halves excited state. Now one of the things we're going to learn about, actually we already sort of know about it, is that uh, strong transitions between levels only occur if there is a, uh, a finite matrix element of the perturbation between the two levels. Now it turns out the the dipole perturbation is uh, such that it only produces finite matrix elements between states of opposite angular momentum, opposite orbital angular momentum. So that means that uh, basically L, capital L, has to change by 1. That's called a selection rule. It just means that uh, in order for the thing to be strongly uh, active, uh, the particular transition has to have a difference in L of 1 between the two states. So, for example, going from an S to a P, or from a P to a D, is relatively strong, but going from an S to a D is quite weak. And that, that has a, a double-edged sword. It means you need a strong laser in order to produce that transition. But it also means that once the electron is in the excited state, the D state, for example, um, it can only decay to the ground state uh, very, very slowly. It turns out it's an electric quadrupole transition, not a dipole transition. And it's very, very weak. The D5 half state takes about a second to decay to the ground state on the average. And uh, that's very long compared to the time frame of the calculation that's going on. And so that's good because it means that the calculation won't be spoiled by spontaneous emissions from the 5 half state to the, to the D5 halves to the S1 half. So the calculation basis, uh, as far as a single ion is concerned, is between the G ket and the E ket. But there's a lot of other stuff that has to go on. And all these other states play a role. So let's, let's talk about it and see how it works. The first thing we have to worry about is how do we cool these guys down. For that, we need a strong transition. And in the case of calcium, typically what folks do is use the S1 half to P1 half transition. It turns out there's another selection rule that says that the transitions are strongest if J changes by plus or minus 1 or 0. And so uh, S1 half to P1 half is a strong transition, as is P1 half to D3 halves. And that presents a little bit of a problem, because if you're using the S1 half P1 half transition to cool the ion, that means that the population in the P1 half level is going to be something on the order of 50% on the average. And if there's a spontaneous decay into the D3 halves level, then um, that's going to be problematic because uh, the atoms or the ions that fall into that level, it's, it's also a very long-lived level. It takes a long time to decay to the S1 half state, but uh, it doesn't participate in the cooling because the cooling happens with the 397 nanometer laser. So because the cooling is happening at 397, uh, it turns out the spontaneous decay of 866 nanometers down to the D3 halves uh, state causes atoms to be lost from the cooling ac action. And so in order to, uh, and also there's a small chance <coughs> that uh, they can get caught in the D5 halves. It's not as strong because that's a delta J of 2, but, uh, but it is possible. And so what folks do is they put in uh, diode lasers at 866 and 854 nanometers to bump those guys out of the metastable states, the D5 halves and the D3 halves, and back up into states that <coughs> can transition to the ground state. 
So they, and through that mechanism, they <coughs> flush those states out so that ions don't get stuck in the metastable states for seconds at a time. The, uh, now, of course, that has a side effect. The D5 halves is strongly coupled to the P3 halves, not as much to the P1 half because delta J is too big. And so uh, that means that the P3 half state is going to get populated. But it's very strongly coupled to the S1 half. And uh, what that means is that it quickly decays, uh, you know, within nanoseconds or something. And so uh, that's basically how the thing works. So in order to cool the guys down, it doesn't just take the cooling laser. It takes three lasers. Two lasers, the 854 and the 866, need to be there to keep ions from getting stuck in these metastable states during the cooling process. Of course, if you're going to do any calculation, you have to turn those guys off because they would completely spoil the calculation. If the, if the 854 laser were on, it would be stealing population from the 5 half state and, uh, and throwing it into the three P3 halves, and that would, of course, then uh, immediately d decay to the ground state. So that would be an artificial route of transition, and so you'd have to turn those two guys off. Uh, what about actual calculation? So to actually do any calculations, we use the uh, S1 half and D5 half state and the 729 nanometer laser line. Um, to make a measurement, you use the 397 nanometer laser line to uh, stimulate fluorescence between the S1 half and the P1 half state. If the system is in the ground state, if the ion is in the ground state, then that transition will produce a strong fluorescence. And you'll s yeah, you can actually see the laser light. On the other hand, if the ion is in the D5 half state, then you'll get no fluorescence. And, uh, and what that means is the thing was in the excited state. So you can measure uh, a 0 or a 1 by shining a 397 nanometer laser at the ion, if it fluoresces, it's in the ground state. If it doesn't fluoresce, it's in the excited state. And that's a form of quantum measurement. The idea is that by varying the polarization, the duration, and the phase of the laser, uh, different computational operators can be realized, such as the U and the V and the Hadamard and so on. And as we talked about in class last time, each of those can be thought of as a rotation of the state in the block sphere. So we're basically using the laser to move the state vector around on the block sphere, and those are equivalent to rotations and uh, reflections and things like that. All right, uh, for the board work for today, I'm going to have you guys compare the level diagram for calcium, magnesium, and barium ions, and we'll talk about the different pluses and minuses, and let me, I'm going to try to get you guys to f discover what the issues are with the other ions and why calcium might be uh, preferable. And uh, also I'd like to have you guys attempt to design an electron trap computer. In other words, what if you could trap electrons in an ion trap somehow and use magnetic fields to produce transitions between spin up and spin down. So you use the spin up and spin down states of an electron in a magnetic field to um, produce computation, C naught gates and stuff like that, and we'll see what the various issues are with that. And that's really all I have for today. We'll see you guys in class.